We close with Fridays with Thurber and something special. James Thurber was political in the early 1950s. He refused an honorary degree from Ohio State, which had been part of his life almost from the day he was born in Columbus in 1894, because he felt the university was knuckling under to McCarthyism. He was political, but rarely was his writing. Yet tonight, from Michael J. Rosen's 1994 compilation, People Have More Fun Than Anybody, a Thurber story from 1956 that starts off innocently enough and then suddenly gives Richard Nixon and then Joe McCarthy himself a quick kick in the index. Help, help, another classificationization by James Thurber. Now, a certain public health expert has come up with a new classification of me and my age group, or be, uh, to be precise, those of us who are in our 60s or older. The public healthist divides us into the institutionalized and the non-institutionalized. As good luck, prayer, and a sound diet would have it, I belong to the non-institutionalized, which includes the working, the up and about but unemployed, and those who are just lying in bed at home. When the time comes for me to be committed to the funny house or a nursing home, I will become an ex-non-institutionalized person. If and when, upon good behavior, I shall be released in the custody of my family, my designation will then be that of an un-ex-non-institutionalized person. When I'm put back in after raising hell on Third Avenue, breaking up Nixon rallies, and other subversive conduct, my new tag will be, as any modern child could tell you at a glance, re-un-ex non-institutionalized. I do not propose to take it lying down when I am dragged back to the institution, and I have a plan already worked out to plague the public health expert in charge till hell won't have it. I will pretend to be a maximum bed rest case until my chart is filled with overconfident descriptions of my various inabilities. Then one bright day when the healthist makes his rounds, I will be hanging from the chandelier in my room, not by my neck, but by my heels, and reciting without missing a word or rhyme all of the Prisoner of Chillon. Editor's note, that is a 392-line poem by Lord Byron. I'd like to think that the healthist will have a number of journalists, colleagues, and state officials in tow, perhaps even the governor. I like to think of him being so shattered by the failure of his analyses and prognosticization of my case that he will have to be completely reclassified himself. Oh, I shall be able to handle him. Have no fear of that. Come, come, Mr. Turble, he will say with a firmness showing clear signs of crumble. Be a good statistic now for these gentlemen and shake hands with the governor. The governor wishes to shake hands with me, I'll reply. You'll have to lie down on his back. I intend to hang here until I've finished intimations of immortality. It will be a great, if considerably confused, victory for me. I had planned to veer off here into one of my attacks on the isationizers who have deformed and bloated our language by isationizing almost every noun and adjective ending in al. But I've decided to conserve my strength for that triumphant day in the funny house or the nursing home. However, I have enough strength for one crack in conclusion. The public figures in America who are largely responsible for the beating English has taken and is still taking don't seem to realize that they are playing verbally into the hands of the communists. Nothing reduces the shape, color, and vitality of individuality so much as isationizing people into a colorless lump of category. I have viewed with alarm this many a year the decline of the spoken word. The trend toward massive meaninglessness got its greatest boost if you haven't caught my alarms in the past, during the McCarthage period, when there seemed to be an unspoken slogan incidental to the attack on everything all along the line. The slogan was lingua delenda est. Uh, editor's second note, that translates from the Latin as language is to be destroyed. I fell asleep upon this ominous Latin phrase recently and dreamed a nightmare. I may be overexerting myself, but I'm going to tell what it was anyway. Two men in uniforms were measuring me for a uniform just like theirs. One man had no mouth, and the other one had no ears, and their names, displayed on badges, were Tweedledum and Tweedledeaf. When they got me dressed up in a kind of gray straitjacket, Tweedledeaf said, It makes you look like everybody else. Does it make you feel like everybody else? Yes, I said. How am I going to tell myself from me? Tweedledeaf grinned evilly. I can't hear what you're saying, he said. But Tweedledum can. If you want any information, ask him. I was about to protest that Tweedledum couldn't say anything, but I realized it wouldn't do any good, whatever I said. 
An amusing thought has just struck me, said Tweedledeaf. You may not be able to tell yourself from you, since you look like everybody and everybody looks like everybody else, so I will put a tail on you. And he put a tail on me, a big chesty tail and a dark suit whose derby kept going up and down his forehead as he slowly chewed something. I woke up at that point, yelling, as usual. I have put down this little description not so much to amuse or frighten anybody as to have a record of it in case my memory should succumb to the obliterating processes of age. Right now it's all right. Right now my classification chart reads as follows. Sex, male, age, going on 62, color of moods, grayish, black, height, indeterminate because of ducking, occupation, sympathizer with lost or unpopular causes, social status, Subject to change without notice? Non-institutionalized. I'll see you in the funny house. Help, help, another classificationization by James Thurber. That's Countdown. I'm Keith Alderman. We'll see you Tuesday. Good night and good luck.